शेखुदेव नम शंखारूपेण मच्छिद अंकृतमोदय किंकरीसा माया शंकराचार्य मास्ते सदाप सदा आत्मा निर्धन कुशेद परामुखम नौमी शास्त्रेश निष्ठा चंद्रशेखर भारती विवेकन महाप्रिख्यम दैर्याय क्षमा सदाव पूर्व तम विद्यातीत गुरु भजे अज्ञा जाहनवी तीर्थ विद्यातीत विवेकना सर्वधम तीर्थ भारती तीर्थमास्त विद्यालय संपन्न वेदलागम विवेकन अंदे वेदांत तत्वज्ञम विदुशेखर भारती सभाव्य सभापति session on wellness our scriptures proclaim that seeking wellness in every aspect by the thoughts deeds and actions is integral to vedic way of life there's a beautiful hymn in atharva veda pashyeva sarvashtham jeeveva sarvashtham buddheva sarvashtham rohheva sarvashtham Let we be blessed to look at hundred atoms, Sardis atom, hundred atoms, which means that let the light of our eyes remain clear for hundred years. Let we live for hundred years. Let our intellect remain strong for hundred years. Let us continue to grow for hundred years and get continuously nourished. Let we stay holy and free from illicit feelings. For hundreds of years, it's a beautiful hymn in Atharva Veda. In fact, Atharva Loka, blessed and initiated by the 35th Jagat Guru of Shringeri, Shyamini Vidyarthi Mahas Swami Hill, seeks to propagate this Vedic wisdom of wellness, living in a full, healthy life in every mental issue of Atharva Loka for 45 years now. and we do this through various programs at this auditorium which is blessed by sri mahasanidharan doing puja in this very place here in in 2012 regular readers of tatvaka would know that we present the articles under four sections first is soul which contains distilled messages from upanishads and scriptures including a direct exclusive message on living in the dharmic way from sri bharati tirtha maha swami swami hel renin jagat guru then there is a section mind with articles on how to take care of the vacillations of the mind due to the influence of the gunas in personal life as well as working life as part of any business organization then the third section body how to take care of one's body the dharmic way since a human body is a temple vedas declare deho devalaya prokto meaning the body is a devalaya and the atman is a presiding deity so we try to carry messages under the body on how to basically live take care of the body in a dharmic manner the last is the fourth section the fourth section in every tatvaloka issue contains some lighter reading such as stories from epics subhashitam and moral stories all stress on wellness based on ethics and values and we carry we take care to see that these messages are simple style conveyed to appeal to the modern minds and today's event is in furtherance of this mission of tatva loka by bringing in two highly experienced medical practitioners to talk about the wellness aspect from allopathic and ayurvedic perspectives we have dr siddhar samji former director and professor of pediatrics and dean maulana azad medical college in new delhi was closely associated with the all india institute of medical sciences new delhi a highly versatile medical professional and teacher dr siddharth is an advisor to the medical council of india he has over 100 research publications and has edited five books he has been deeply involved in health studies and health camps in various state governments and he regularly delivers talks on at major institutions and i saw your his program in the uh, bharatiya vidyabhavan uh, video program some time ago 
He is associated with several NGOs and voluntary organizations. Dr. Siddharth was born, brought up in Delhi, and he has moved to Chennai in the post-COVID times. He and his wife, also a medical professional with specialization in dental surgery, she is here, are avid seekers and disseminators of knowledge. Welcome to Dr. Siddharth. <laughs> Dr. Janathan Heber is an MD in Ayurveda and has about three decades of teaching and consulting experience. He is an avid writer and blogger. He is writing on various aspects of Ayurveda and wellness has been appearing in Tattuloka in every issue for several years now. And people, readers, comment very nicely about the articles. He has authored five popular books on Ayurveda and co-authored two textbooks on Ayurvedic mineralogy. Some of his books such as Ayurveda Tarka, Tridosha Made Easy, Easy Ayurveda Home Remedies, Living Easy with Ayurveda, they are on a display outside the auditorium and you may wish to take a look at them. Dr. Rebber was born in Sringeri. He lives in Mangalore and is currently busy establishing a 53-bedded hospital at Mangalore with inpatient and outpatient care, including panchakarma, yoga, and physiotherapy. Welcome, Dr. Jara. We look forward to the presentations of the two experts. This will be followed by question and answers by the audience. I request uh, any questions to be read, to read down on the, the pad provided by the volunteers, which would help save time and avoid repetitions. Thank you once again for coming this evening, despite uh, the thunders and the uh, clouds of incessant inclement weather. Thank you very much. Very much. Uh, I request Dr. Ramji to give his presentation first. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Krishnamurti, <clears throat> for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to be amongst you. There's a disclaimer I have to make. I am no wellness guru or expert. And I was wondering what uh, makes me eligible to be talking to you this <clears throat> evening. I'm a pediatrician by training. I think that's the only branch of medicine where we look at healthy people. Uh, we also look at diseased people. All other branches look at people when they become diseased. But our business is to look at kids uh, look at the growth, the development, the nutrition to make sure they don't become sick. The second thing that I was wondering is, uh, when I was looking at the topic, is there an allopathic or an Ayurvedic or another medical viewpoint? I have over the years believed that I don't think there is really a difference and I will, you will know when I finish that the community's perspective of how a branch of medicine uh, plays out is the way that practitioners actually approach the subject. And so I will try to kind of share with you, uh, and I hope at the end of the day, after you heard me and Dr. Hebar, you realize that uh, all forms of medicine, uh, all forms of healthcare uh, actually look at wellness in a fairly similar way. So let me begin uh, by this uh, understanding what we talk about wellness. I'm sure it means very different things to different people. So can I ask somebody in the audience to tell me what they believe is wellness. So what does it mean to you when somebody says wellness? Absence of, Absence of disease, all right. Can I get somebody, the youngsters in the back, what does it mean to you? Physically fit. Physically fit. Medicine Sorry? Medicine-free life. Medicine-free life. <laughs> so, you know, um, <clears throat> It obviously means different things to different people. And when we were to just open a dictionary, and you look at the Oxford Dictionary, it says the following. And it says that it's a state of being comfortable, healthy, or happy. And the Cambridge Dictionary says it's just a state of feeling healthy or happy. 
You know, health is relatively still easier to define. But happiness to me is a rather an abstract idea. Of course, um, there have been great attempts uh, at the moment, and you all know that countries have been ranked and graded as per what they call a happiness index. But when you read through those uh, components of the happiness index, you'll realize that hardly any of them actually reflect what we all perceive when we feel happy. So if you actually look beyond the simple dictionary meaning of, or explanation of what well-being is, it will cover a lot of things that you people have said. You know, it includes um, our emotions, it looks at physical well-being, it looks at uh, occupational well-being, it talks about environment, social, spiritual, financial, intellectual, you know, there's a whole gamut of con dimensions which for different people mean different things. But eventually you all realize they're all interconnected in some form to give us the sense of well-being which uh, effect effectively actually impacts our health, our quality of life, and eventually what we call as well-being. Of course, what I shall do in the next uh, 20 odd minutes is largely ref restrict myself to the, the health component of well-being and also say how some of these other dimensions which I just alluded to uh, actually impacts uh, health. Um, and you'll clearly realize that, uh, you know, even when the WHO defines of what is health, it says very clearly that it's a state of uh, complete physical, mental, social well-being, and not just an absence of disease or infirmity. So you clearly realize that uh, we recognize that uh, wellness and health is a very encompassing entity uh, where a lot of things which are not directly related to the practice of medicine, uh, our social structure, our cultural milieus, actually have a great impact on the way uh, we remain well. <clears throat> the problem of why modern medicine or allopathy uh, is perceived a little differently by most people is because the way practitioners of modern medicine work. We, are, we have been, for, for some reason over the last several decades, become very disease-centric. We only talk about, there's a disease, um, how do I treat it? Uh, we don't, we are not people-centric. We are not community-centric, which is the essence of how populations and people become well. It is seen as something that public health persona has to do. And uh, most people believe that I should simply be looking at somebody who comes with complaints and I, therefore I should treat. I think that's one of the reasons why uh, pediatricians are largely public health people, because we are looking at preventing disease rather than treating it. So, I think it's time that modern medicine or any medical science now starts looking at these other dimensions. And you know, it's important for us therefore to kind of understand uh, uh, the social underpinnings of uh, disease or lifestyle, which is the reason why we are so burdened with this uh, huge number of non-communicable diseases, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, cardiac disease, cancers, you know, uh, they are actually becoming an epidemic. Uh, more people die due to these than what COVID did to us in this uh, short epidemic we had. I don't know how many of you saw in June of this year, the Indian Council of Medical Research released uh, uh, data of the burden of these diseases. It was, it was, it was widely 
uh, published in the lay press. And the, this data is something that should worry us. What it showed for India was that 11% of our population are diabetics, frankly diabetics. But 15% are what we call pre-diabetics. They are people who are not overtly diabetic, but they can just simply tilt and become diabetics if we don't take care. And if you assume that even 50% of them do, which is what probably really happens, you will end up with almost one-fifth of the population being a diabetic. A little over a third of us, 35% of us are hypertensive. Almost 30% of us are obese. And when we look at what all these diseases do in terms of contributing to our survival, uh, you know, if you just look at stroke, cardiac disease, diabetes alone, contribute to 25% of the global burden of deaths. And if you add cancers to it, one third. Which means just this handful of four or five chronic non communal disease today are shortening our lifespans. Uh, even though, uh, you know, if you look at the time when India became independent, and when we are now, in India we became independent, we had a life expectancy of around 40. Today we are close to 70. But does that mean that it has made our life, our quality of life better? And it certainly hasn't, because you can see these data sets clearly tell us. And what is even more worrying, if you look at this data, is the gap between genders is minimal. There was a time when we said, you know, men were more prone to something and women less. But today the gender gap is less. And also the urban-rural divide has disappeared. For a long time we believed that our people in the rural areas are protected. This is far from the truth. So the genders, the place of a dwelling, all have become seamlessly one at this moment. And so it's something that we should really look at as what is happening. So let me try to explain this without being very technical. Imagine yourself that you have to get across from one side to another piece of land across a bridge or a small tunnel. And just imagine if there were multiple roads coming in with no controls Everybody is going to find and fight to get through that narrow passage. There'll be multiple things that will happen that will hurt us. And we'll come out. When we come out, we realize that I have turned left, but there are three cars in front of me. So I have to go many more miles further before I can get back to the road that leads me to my destination. You're frustrated, anger. You may or may not even reach your destination sometimes. So when we look at this disease and this relationship to what triggers it, so these multiple approach roads are all those so-called risk factors we talk about. It could be our <clears throat> diet, it could be our activity or other inactivity, it could be the environment, whatever it is, stress, and at the other end, this chaos through this little tunnel manifests in different ways. Diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiac disease. And there is this little link which does something to all of us. And we now know that this common link between this exposure and disease is an entity which are all familiar in other parlance, is inflammation. For most of us, if we say inflamed, we think of a boil, it's a red swelling. But inflammation is a process, biologically, that is happening. You know, inflammation, of course, is meant to be a defense mechanism. It's supposed to protect us against a, an onslaught of things that happen. But 
What we also now know is this inflammatory process turns and attacks our own body systems and tissues. So from a healer, it is becoming a killer. So what do you do about it? Well, somebody may say, okay, inflammation, that's what we do. We have a pain, we have some, we pop in a few pills of anti-inflammatory drugs. So, okay, if I can break this bridge, exposure won't lead to outcome. That's not true. That's not going to happen. You can keep popping pills and the pills are going to cause other things to us. So the bottom line is that we have to understand what these triggers are and how do we control them. And one of the most interesting things that we now know, which we have seen in our ancient scriptures or ancient medical literature, is diet. And I'm sure Dr. Hebar will talk a lot more about diets. Now, how do diets operate? And one of the most important triggers for whether we have an increased inflammatory response or a decreased inflammatory response are bacteria which are present in our intestines. And we call all of these together what we now know in modern science as the gut microbiome. It's a whole colony of variety of bacteria and other microbes. Some of them are good, which help suppress the inflammation. And some of them, if they are in abundance, are going to exaggerate inflammation. And all that we see, whether it's diabetes, whether it's hypertension, whether it's heart disease, all of them are a result of chronic inflammatory processes in our body systems. And I'll talk more about how this diet plays a role, but just to remember that if the common understanding today is that inflammation is the key player in all the disease that we actually are seeing. So how do you find you know, evidence for it? You know, the, the way modern medicine probably is different from many other forms of medicine is the modern medicine asks the question, where is the evidence? Show me a randomized controlled trial which says that this is what happens, and so I'll believe it. So I think the only way modern medicine becomes a little different from more traditional systems of medicine is that it's asking for evidence. But of course, there are levels of evidence. And so without getting into the complexities of science, the simple ways can we look amongst ourselves at people or groups of people who are living into the 80s, 90s, maybe 100 without having encountered all these chronic diseases. I think that's, that's the simplest way of saying what is it that makes them different from us? So there are Obviously, you cannot subject people to say that you have this lifestyle and become ill, which is unethical today. I can't do that. You know, that's what Hitler did uh, during the, uh, what he did in the concentration camps. And uh, it was following that that we had a set of rules got created about how human trials need to be conducted. But nature offers us the most magnificent way of looking at natural experiments at which we can get answers. So there are two groups of people that we can look at. I'm sure many of you have read something called, people use this term, super-agers. Have you heard this term called super-agers? Any of you? Well, super-agers are people who are in the 80s, 90s, or maybe 100, whose cognitive or physical fitness is comparable to somebody who's 30 or 35. So the question is, okay, can I look at what, how are these super-agers different uh, from those of us? Are there any lessons to be learned for us to say how we, we grow into longevity remaining well? Of course, you may be, uh, 
a cognitive superager, but not physically fit. You may be physically superager, but you, and some may be both. So if you look at the cognitive superagers, who, whose memories and intellect and capacity to do reasoning is as good as 30 or 40 year old, we now know through all our wonderful diagnostic and imaging systems that the volume of the gray matter, which is the great part of where all our memory functions and so on reside, is much greater than their own peers of the same age. And they're very comparable to somebody who is maybe 20 years younger. And clearly, the areas related to reasoning memory are much better preserved in these people. We now have evidence for all that, right? So what do these people do? Or what did they do? Well, they challenged themselves mentally. They kept challenging themselves. A simple way to challenge yourself is to keep doing crosswords, some puzzles, Sudoku maybe. Try to train a youngster to appear for one of these competitive exams. Or something sim different. I'm sure all of us, after a point of time when we retire, say, oh, there are wonderful things I wanted to do but could not do. So challenge yourself to start doing things which you never did. Learn a musical instrument, start write poetry, join a theater. So you challenge yourself and say, I must do well. So clearly, you have to do this. And I, I've seen that with many people. My own uncle was, I think, one great example who into his 90s, till he actually was unable to read and see because of retinal degeneration, was somebody who would work out mathematical problems and physical physics problems into his 90s and, and had a memory and capacity which could compete with a lot of young people. So it's true that it keeps happening. Then you have these so-called very fit people. Uh, you can see an 80-year-old running a marathon and jogging well. So what makes them different? And if you look at, you know, a good measure of your physical fitness is the amount of oxygen you can utilize for that set of activity. The more the oxygen you utilize, the better it is. And we know with age, our capacity to utilize oxygen decreases, and that's one of the reasons why many of us tire, can't do the same extent of activity as it did 20 years ago. And many of them actually run uh, rigorous routines. I don't know how many of you have heard of uh, uh, <coughs> Ruth Ginsburg, she was uh, a justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, she became a judge of the U.S. Supreme Court in 1993. And till she died in 2020 at the age of 87, she was a judge and very, very fit. Uh, she at the age of 65 had developed colonic cancer but the moment she recovered, she got herself a personal trainer and she ran through a fitness routine. And even into her 80s, the kind of fitness routine that she could run, of course many of us of her age could not do, but I think many younger than her could not run those routines uh, with such efficiency. So age was no bar. Remember she was 60 plus, she had her cancer, but she was somebody who believed that all this cannot stop me from doing. So clearly, uh, it, it doesn't matter what our age is. We can always catch up to do better. But it doesn't mean that all these superagers did not have diabetes or hypertension. So then we need to actually move away and look at communities where they lived long and also did not have such diseases. And we now have such communities which are now known as the blue zones. Uh, there are five regions which have been identified. Uh, the island of Okinawa in Japan, uh, <clears throat> Sardinia, 
and we have the <coughs> Seventh day Adventists who live in uh, Loma Linda in California. We have the area of Icaria in Greece, and uh, in Costa Rica, we have the Nicoya Peninsula. These are regions where people have traditionally lived into their 80s and 90s, uh, and they have, these communities have very low rates of uh, any of these non-communicable diseases. So the National Institutes for Aging of the United States actually decided to understand and research into what is common across these people. And I think this is a lesson which may be applicable to a lot of us and easy to do, which would be the, the key take-homes of, of my talk today. The one thing they noticed was these people are active, had a routine every day. Uh, it's not like the current office goers who sits in, a, in front of a computer for eight hours and then decides to go to a gym and do a rigorous workup. It's terrible. Actually, it's the worst thing that can happen. The human body is not meant to be undergo acceleration and sudden deceleration. There has to be a continuous activity. So these are people who continue to work and even most of these areas, these people continue to do their farming or whatever else they have to even at the age of 80 or 90. So the, the key is being active every day in a, and having a routine for it. The second was the diet. Uh, the diets were largely fresh fruits and vegetables and whole grains, oats, brown rice, barley, nuts, beans, fish and eggs. And we all know today that this diet is the most efficient way of bringing back healthy bacteria into the gut, which obviously means low inflammation, which translates into saying you have less hypertension, cardiac disease, and so on. And also, in addition to that, their diets had very little sugar. Sugar, we know, is a wonderful substrate for bacteria to grow on, and low in red meat. So, clearly, our dietary patterns uh, have a big role. And I think if you go back to our traditional diets in India in particular, in the past, I think they had all of this. Modernization, unfortunately, has changed all that. And processed foods are, as we know today, the worst culprits. And we have now uh, data on how um, it affects young people. I've been involved in a large research on microbiomes in early infancy and childhood. And we know how uh, use of these processed foods as compared to more natural foods uh, bring in more of these so-called non-good bacteria into the gut of kids and um, result in many problems, including obesity, right? The other thing that was noticed in these communities was controlled eating. Most of them would stop eating when they are 75 or 80 percent full. Overeating is another disaster. See, even though it may be good food, even overeating of good food has a problem. So I think there needs to be moderated, right? The third thing they found that nobody in these communities smoked. And we know how nicotine is a trigger for inflammation too, okay? And the fourth was that they remained socially engaged. Uh, they had get-togethers, they spent time with friends, you know, they enjoyed an afternoon nap. And we know that today, uh, all these actually reduce stress. And stress is the, one of the worst culprits. It may not show on my face, but it slowly ignores into your system uh, and can just simply trigger inflammation. 
And lastly, for them, the families are most important. Living with the multi-generational family uh, was one of the most important things that they saw across these communities. I think in traditional joint family systems, when you lived across generations, it was one of the most uh, efficient shock absorbers for stress. I think today, in this changing world, we can see what it's doing to all of us, both the young and the old. But they found two other things which are not necessarily common across all these communities, but uh, they had them. That there was, you need to have a purpose in our lives. The Japanese call the ikigai. Do we have a purpose in our life, what we want to do? There has to be a purpose for us to exist. And for some of these communities, their ikigai or the purpose was lifelong responsibility to help the family or contribute to the community. Each one of us can have something else, but there has to be a purpose for us to remain happy and healthy. And of course, they also found that those who attended um, spiritual services and faith-based services, which is so common in India, uh, we get together for a uh, bhajan, we get together for some spiritual talk, uh, we all get together to read a shloka. I mean, all this, in a way, uh, actually has a role in reducing stress, and we have now very ample, good scientific data to show we can measure all these stresses. In fact, a very recent publication showed that what we have is something called a functional MRI, where we can actually map, and you can see how the areas uh, where, which control our emotions and how they change with people who practice a meditation or part of this. So uh, it is not just the physical activity, it's not just the diet, uh, but I think there are other things, as, as you said, as, as a social, we are, humans are social beings. And so we simply have to live within a happy social structure, right? Somebody may ask me, okay, what, it's fine, all this is good, but I have a family history of diabetes, my father was a diabetic, my mother was a diabetic, my brother's a diabetic. So what happens? I'm still going to, even will I, I will still end up being a diabetic. Well, the answer to that is no. While we have a genetic predisposition, we now know that we have the capacity to change the way our genes function. This is a reversible phenomenon. You can make it good, bad. The, the DNA structure won't change, but the function changes. It's what we today know as epigenetics. I have now been for three decades involved in looking at how maternal diet, and we have now cohorts and we have followed women from pre-pregnancy, through the pregnancy, their children, their, their children, and we have a huge cohort in Delhi called the New Delhi Birth Cohort, which we are following now to the fourth generation. And we have very good data on all this business about what happens. And one of the things that we noticed, if mothers' diets and health is not good, they give birth to smaller babies, and we know that when they're exposed to the current lifestyle, there's a huge geometric rise in the occurrence of abnormal blood sugar, hypertension, and so on, even by the age of 20, 25. And we are currently involved in two large cohort studies, one at Pune and Mysore, to saying how, if we can modulate mothers' diets and their lifestyles and reduce stress, what impact it has. We already have results from one of our studies in Delhi to show the age of five years, these children are much better. So clearly, it is possible for all of us, doesn't matter how late it is, you can switch the function. Yes, I, I might have for 50 years lived a certain way of life, but, and I might have even had some disease. I may not be able to, I may, if it's the early stages, reverse it, at least I can prevent this progression. And those of us who haven't had it, it's high time that we worked on ourselves 
to make sure it doesn't happen. So age is no restriction. As I said, all these diseases are catching up on us from in the second and third decade. I've had so many of my colleagues who died of coronary artery disease in the 40s. Uh, you may say that the stress of being a physician, uh, but but the thing is that even with physicians, it's high time. I have been constantly reminded by my wife during the days when I used to function. Mine was a 24 by 7 function because I used to look after neonates in the ICU. That you need to slow down. And, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I never had it. I mean, I never felt I was ill till the COVID came. And I was charged with establishing a COVID hospital in 15 days, which I did. We set up a huge 300-bedded uh, COVID hospital in 15 days. And during the setting up process, uh, there were equipment that came in, and so I was testing it and told one of my residents, I said, why didn't you check my blood pressure? I want to see if the machine works. And he took a blood pressure, kept quiet. I said, what's wrong? So I'll take it again and again. He said, sir, your blood pressure is 230 by 160. I know symptoms. I was feeling very good. Anyway, I went back to my cardiologist. And of course, um, they did everything else. Fortunately, things were in good shape except my high blood pressure. And this in spite of the fact that I had a diet which is very similar to what you see here. I used to do yoga regularly. I used to uh, meditate. But probably what I wasn't aware of was the stress of working under these conditions, though I never probably expressed it, but expressed in the form of high blood pressure. Well, thankfully now, I've gone off most of my medication, except one, and I continue to do the rest. So the bottom line of what I wish to say is that wellness is in our hands. It doesn't need a great deal of sophistication. It needs us to rewind a bit to what traditionally we have seen in our cultures and make as much amends as we can within the society in which we exist uh, if we do not want to become succumb to all these increasing burden of disease. I used to complain that, you know, being in Delhi all these years, we had the luxury of wonderful pavements, parks. I used to miss that in Chennai. The only place you can go to is maybe the marina, and I don't think, I, my recollections of the marina as a child was so nice, but still, I, I do my four or five kilometer walk every morning. Uh, in the marina in spite of, because that's the only way I can keep myself uh, well and fit at this time. So thank you so much, and I'm sure that at the end of the day, you'll realize after Dr. Hebar has given his presentation, that all forms of medicine eventually will subscribe to very simple things which are important to keep ourselves healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doctor. I think this is a good uh, roundup of how to control the mind with, in terms of information, challenging activity, and social engagement. I request Dr. Hebert to come online. Namaste. Um, before I start presenting, I'd like to offer my pranams to Sri Sharda Mata of Sringeri and Sri Jagadguru, Sri Shankaracharya ji, and his lineage of uh, Swamiji's, including Sri Bharti Tirtha Swamiji. And I thank Tattvaloka and the whole team for presenting with this beautiful opportunity to connect with all of you. And my pronouns to Dr. Siddharth ji and Sri Krishnamurti ji also. So well-being from allopathic and Ayurvedic perspective, uh, uh, first thing is that, like Dr. Siddharth sir clearly mentioned, there's no 
allopathic way of getting into well-being or Ayurvedic way of getting well-being. As Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsaji uh, used to tell, that all rivers lead to the ocean. Similarly, all the medical sciences, including yoga, naturopathy, physiotherapy, Ayurveda, or allopathy, we are all trying to help people to get into the zone of well-being. Uh, so there is no one or the other way. There is always many different ways collectively helping all of us to, to get into the zone of well-being and trying to stay there for as long as possible. So, um, so I dedicate this also to my spiritual guru, Dr. H. Chandrikshekar Udupa Ji. And I come from easyairoda.com. So well-being, there are many different definitions, as Dr. Ramji sir clearly explained. It's a state of being healthy and happy. And uh, Dr. Ram Ramji sir explained how happiness is very different and very subjective in its nature, that for me, happiness could be, maybe at this juncture, say, earning some amount of rupees. Maybe a million dollar would make me happy. For a child, it would be just getting a toy and playing with it all the time could be happiness. So that is uh, having many different dimensions. We'll get to that in a minute. So it, clearly the wellness or well-being has both the physical and mental component together. And there is this Centers for Disease Control and Prevention called as CDC in USA. So it explains well-being is a positive outcome that is meaningful for people and for many sectors of society because it tells us that people perceive that their lives are going well. So here, first we discuss that there is physical and mental component for well-being and there is also this social component of well-being. As Dr. Siddhartha rightly quoted the, the book called as Aikigai, uh, in which the, the people from Okinawa of Japan, they have a sense of social responsibility. They're not rich, but as a, together as a community, they come together, help each other, and that social responsibility and mutually helping each other and living as a component of a social life rather than living as a solitary life gives them a bigger purpose and it makes them to wake up in the, in the morning with a lot of energy and a definitive purpose of contributing to the society in a positive way is also a big part of social well-being. So this was always, always there in the Indian system also. Unfortunately, due to the modern influence and so on and so forth, we are moving away and probably now is the time that we come back to this life of social well-being and getting together as a society and doing, doing good to each other and living as a society rather than thinking of ourselves as just solitary, well, uh, sol solitary human beings. Next is uh, Center of uh, CDC again explains that good living condition, housing, employment are fundamental to well-being. So for us to feel healthy and happy, there should be some social security net also. So that comes with social well-being that, you know, if I get some sickness, there, there are other people in the community who would help me. So that gives one sense of uh, security net. And there is also this housing, employment, and financial component as well. So if you take the ancient textbooks of Ayurveda, it says the main purpose of Ayurveda is enabling the people to have four purusharthas or chaturvida purusharthas. So they are explained as dharma, artha, kama and moksha. So dharma is the rightful living in a righteous way as a responsible person in the society. Artha is earning, earning money in a righteous way, not by stealing etc. by doing the hard work in an ethical way. Then karma, fulfilling our desires, and then comes the moksha. Or so with the dharma and artha, we fulfill our desires of this life. Then at, at a certain age, we think of life beyond and doing 
all the spiritual activities and uh, sadhanas for the journey beyond this life. So that is the purpose of life. So there is this artha component, there is this uh, 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 financial component also attached to our happiness and also for well-being. And uh, incidentally, there is this uh, quote of uh, uh, ideal patient and then in, in, uh, what is the ideal nature of a patient? Uh, in that it is clearly explained that the patient should be adhya. Adhya means he should have good amount of money with him so as to, so as to uh, afford a wide range of treatment so that he can come out of his disease. So well-being is associated with self-perceived health, longevity, healthy behavior, mental and physical illness, social connectedness, product, productivity, factors in the physical and social environment. The productivity part was well covered by Dr. Siddharth Sayar, in which he explains that there should, we should, when we wake up in the morning, we should have a definitive purpose for us. That definitive purpose need not be like earning so much money or, you know, doing a good for their life and society and uplifting the world in a positive way. It can be that big or it can be even as small as doing pottery or writing a poem or something which fulfills our heart. It can be the smaller ones also. So these smaller things, that the smaller aims that we have, that itself is called as the ikigai or the smaller purposes of life, which kept intact for a longer period of time, helps us to live longer. And that is the uh, secret of people living in the blue zones, as explained by Siddhar sir, in the Greece, in the Costa Rica, in the California, in Japan, where people live longer. Not because they have the money or they live a disease-free life, because along with that, they also have good purpose for their life, with which they wake up every day with good amount of energy and spend larger portion of their life fulfilling that purpose. It can be as simple as pottery or writing a poem or teaching or doing what we love the most, doing what we are passionate about. So healthy living as told by World Health Organization is not just living disease free, but it's also it's just the mere absence of disease is not uh, healthy living, it also has physical, mental, social, and also spiritual component for it. So Ayurvedic, coming to the Ayurvedic definition of healthy living and well-being, it explains, so this is from Sushruta Samhita, Sutrasana section. Acharya Sushruta writes, Samadoshaha, Samagnishcha, Samadhatu, Malakriyaha, Prasanna Atma Indriya Manaha, Swasta Ityabhidhiyate. So swastha or swastya is a, is a word that is used for the well-being. For one, someone to be well-being, or to be called as swastha or healthy, the three doshas should be well-balanced. As per Ayurveda, there are three doshas in the body, vata, pitta and kapha. We are going to cover that in a short while. So these three should be well-balanced. Then agni, the digestive fire should be well-maintained. Uh, it's told that rogaha sarve pi jayante sutaram udaranicha, meaning all diseases originate from the udara or the, from the stomach or the digestive tract itself. Like Dr. Siddhartha told, there is big interest in all the science forms about maintaining a healthy gut bacteria. The unhealthy gut bacteria is related with very different diseases which are totally not related to the gut health itself. For example, unhealthy gut bacteria is, uh, is being studied as a cause for Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is a totally neurological disorder, but that still, is, has, still has some connectivity with the gut health. So, agni or the digestive fire, which controls the digestion and metabolism, we need to take care. That's why it is advised to eat a little less than reaching the point of satiation. So we want to have more food, but lesser food makes us to live longer. There's also funny uh, uh, anecdotal uh, ancient uh, uh, comment that your life, the number of days that you live, 
that can also be counted on number of rice grains that you that you that you are going to eat so lesser the amount of rice or the lesser the amount of food that you eat probably there is good chance that you will live longer and healthier for a very long period of time and then so that is sama agni maintaining constant good digestive fire and then there is sama dhatu so we have all the body tissues in the body there is blood there is muscle fat bones etc so whatever we we consume should be digested well in the digestive system and that nutrition should be well absorbed by our body tissues and well utilized by our body tissues only then it the energy that we are consuming the petrol that we are putting into our vehicle gets transformed into real meaningful energy if you just consume well you though if we are eating healthy if you are not exercising well and utilizing it in a positive way being physically active that also can lead to lot of problems so not only the food that we take get should get digested well it should be well absorbed and well utilized by all our body tissues only then it leads to swasthya or wellness then then samadhatu uh, uh, is explained and then prasanna we should have some amount of content and happiness and satisfaction so that content happiness and satisfaction should be felt by our atma that is soul by our indriyas or sense organs and by mana that is mind there is little this little bit you know from the physical explanation of health etc we are getting into the spiritual realm here so atma should be content for for that we need to be spiritual we need to adopt some sort of spiritual practices into our life it can be as simple as doing a puja or doing an aarti or going to a temple or chanting some mantras some some activity in that way and some de- some desire for us to have a life good life even beyond this life will help us to have swasthya or wellness and indriyas so sense organs so there is also a spiritual theory that so desires are to be controlled uh, buddha explained that you know we have to control the desires so desires are to be controlled but there is also a theory that this some some of the those desires under the limit should also be fulfilled only then the mind can concentrate on the life beyond and the spirituality etc probably that's the reason why dharma is explained first and then the artha and then the kama and then the moksha that's why even the vedas and the many spiritual uh, scriptures explain about vana prastha ashrama above 40 above 60 where person has fulfilled all his duties the social duty the family duties etc and then he thinks about the spirituality and takes some measures in that direction so as much as we want to control our sense organs and this one we still are family people and all for a monk or for who are 100% spiritually oriented it is easy for them to contribute fully into controlling sense organs for the rest of us so to speak the mere mere mortals probably some amount of self, sense organ satiation is also very much required to achieve the sense of well being then there is this mind so mind is also explained as part of the sense organ it's explained as jnanendriya and also the karmendriya also so so though we are doing the spiritual work though we are doing our bit to be spiritual it is also important to have small happinesses in our in our, in our daily life going to a movie or watching the serial or reading a book so all these things also contribute to this well being as much as our total consciousness and effort should be there to achieve the moksha and other things we should we need not give up our day to day happiness moments for the greater good 
In fact, these smaller happiness moments, the jokes that we share amongst our friends, the jokes that even we watch or see in social media, etc., they also contribute to happiness, and that that will also those happiness collectively will help us in achieving the uh, well-being in a larger sense also. So. If you condense the whole sloka that we just discussed, it, it explains as the tridoshas being balanced, digestive fire working properly, that digestive fire absorbing the nutrition into the body, that is also happening properly, and all the physiological processes in the body, the respiration, the muscle, uh, uh, muscle work, the neural nervous system, the brain and the nerves, etc., all together working properly, and the sense of satisfaction and happiness in the soul, mind, and sense organs, this is explained in Ayurveda as well-being. So, coming to, let's break down each component and uh, understand this a little bit. First is the Tridosha balance. So, Tridosha are three in number. There are this Vata, Pitta, and Kapha Doshas. Vata can be generally understood as the air component of the body and pitta as the fire component and kapha as water and earth component of the body. So this vata, pitta and kapha, they control the mind, control the digestive fire, control the, all the body tissues, etc. If you take the whole body, if you take computer, there are two components in it. One is the software and one is the hardware. So, so hardware is the keyboard and the hard disk and other things, the screen, etc. The software is the inner formula which controls the computer to act in a particular way. Similarly, the body components are the, we are made up of blood, there is bone, there is tissues, there is all the other physical components. So these are all connected and controlled by the software called as Tridosha and they, can, the balance of this, the unison and friendly way in which the Vata, Pitta, Kapha acting together is health. So Vata is the air component of the body the, it controls all sort of movement. F movement of hands, movement of joints, movement of muscles, nerve conduction, food movement, gut, uh, the food movement in the gut, blood circulation. Even if you take a cell, there are many components in which uh, there, are, there are some components coming, there are some components which are going. So all the movements from the cellular tissue to the whole body level, all the movements are controlled by Vata Dosha. Pitta is a fire component of the body, like, like I explained. So fire means digestive fire, the, so, so the whole of digestion and metabolism is controlled by Pitta Dosha. Nutrition absorption and utilization, even at, not only at the digestive tract level, but also at the cellular and tissue level is also controlled by Pitta Dosha. So Pitta largely means digestion and metabolism. And then there is Kapha Dosha. Okay, Vata is controlling all the movements of the body and the uh, different components inside the body moving is controlled by Vata Dosha. Pitta is the fire, so it is taking care of the digestion and metabolism. So, so uh, these two are doing the heavy work. But between these two, there should be some negotiator, some balancing factor, that is the Kapha Dosha, which is made up of, say, water and earth component. It brings in that cushioning effect that shock absorption in the joints, the stability of the body. It gives the body stability, weight, and framework. So this, these are the three, dish, three doshas and they should be in balance. So balance of three doshas is considered as health. Vata, Pitta, and Kapha being balanced is considered as health. And imbalance of these Vata, Pitta, and Kapha is, is, is the definition of disease. So, Let's understand a little bit of how imbalance of uh, this Tridosha with some examples. So if Vata Dosha is responsible for all the movements, so normal walking, so to three to five kilometers a day, healthy walking, gives good balance and support to Vata Dosha, so the joints will be healthy. But if someone is walking excessively for hours together and doing excessive exercise, uh, like uh, Ramji sir told, we are not meant to you know, run marathons every day or do heavy sort of work. But if someone is indulging in that, so they, we say that vata dosha increase in the body. So what that, that vata increase means? So when vata increases, air component increases. So when the air component increases, there is this 
gastritis, uh, we call it as uh, uh, bloating, then there is joint and muscle pain, then there is bone degeneration, slowly the bones become weaker, and there is weakness and pain and other symptoms setting. So that is vata imbalance. The way to manage that is managing, the, managing vata under control, not doing excessive exercises or indulging a heavy spicy diet, so on and so forth. So next is pitta, which is a fire component. For the digestive fire to work well, one is that we have to have good portion control, it's told. We have to eat just below our level of satiation. We should not be overeating. And we should be eating good amount of spices in our diet. They bring in the antioxidants and maintain the body, uh, body nutrition very well. But if someone is excessively taking very highly spicy diet, then the fire component in the body goes up and the pitta dosha also goes up. And if someone is exposing themselves to a very hot summer sun, then also the fire component goes up and pitta dosha goes up. So it leads to the symptoms like increase of burning sensation and uh, acid peptic disorder, what you call as GERD and hypertension and bleeding diseases and skin diseases, so on and so forth. So the fire component acting uh, aggressively. So that should not happen, so we should balance pitta dosha, we should always keep the pitta dosha under check. That is pitta dosha balance. Next is kapha dosha, earth and water component. So healthy amounts of sweet and salt. Ayurveda explains that the whole of the diet should not be just of one particular taste or one particular component only. It cannot be like oily and fried foods in one end and it cannot be just the fruits and vegetables only. So there was an unfortunate incident in US very recently where a veganism is becoming very famous and people live just with the fruits and vegetables. That, too, that particular uh, lady, health blogger, she was living just with the raw fruits and vegetables. So as much as the raw fruits and vegetables are very good and we require it, as much as that is required, we also require milk, we also require our you know, chicken and the eggs, and so whoever wants to take that. Uh, non who are accustomed to non-vegetarian diet. Uh, that, that's what the blue zone diet is explained, the fruits and the nuts and the uh, grains and the brown rice, so on and so forth. There's a big book on the blue zone uh, diet itself called as a blue zones kitchen, which uh, has very good rating in Amazon and all. So the, f the diet, the food that we eat should not be dominated just with the one component, it should be well balanced with all the components. We need some dairy products, some grains, some fruits and some vegetables, some dry fruits and so on and so forth. So if we are eating only the one type of sweet, salty, oily and fried foods, and we, if we are not exercising and we are not utilizing the nutrition that is coming in our way in a positive way, that leads to sedentary habits, that leads to obesity, that leads to diabetes and hypertension, so on and so forth. So that is explained as kapha. So kapha imbalance leads to obesity, excessive cold foods, sweet foods, etc. are told as causative factors for uh, cough, cold, weak digestion, and uh, digestive disorders. So we need to balance the kapha dosha also. So all in all, so vata, pitta and kapha, we have a broad view. The balance, keeping them in balance leads to health and imbalance of that is, itself is the definition of disease. So after that, the digestive fire. So it, like I told, rogaha sarve pi jayante sutaram udaranicha, that maintenance of digestive fire leads to health and imbalance of that leads to disease. So we need to eat a li limited food. And whatever we do, there should be a component of our mind concentrating on the gut health. If the gut health is good, everything sort of brings into balance. And there's also, there is big amount of uh, uh, concentration on the fermented foods. So in the ancient times also, there were varieties of pickles which were fermented and they were eaten on a daily basis. Buttermilk was part of the diet. It is explained that how the nectar or uh, uh, ambrosia is there for the gods. For the human beings, the buttermilk itself is a nectar because it, it contains healthy amount of bacteria and it's also a fermented food. So it, the, or we should be taking that 
and you know we should be concentrating on the healthy maintenance of digestive fire with good amount of spices in our diet then comes the body tissues we have the you know ayurveda explains sapta dhatus as seven different body tissues the food that we take gets converted into nutrition the nutrition then goes on to nourish the blood then blood from muscle muscle to the fat fat to the bone bone to the bone marrow and then the reproductive system the whole this is a sequence in which the nourishment flows as explained in ayurveda and each component should be given importance all in all it means to say that whatever the food that we get should be well absorbed and utilized for which an active lifestyle with some amount of exercise either in the form of walking yoga uh, exercise even the gym also in limits is good in ayurveda there's a very famous uh, sentence called as ati sarvatra varjayet we have to eat spice like at all how much to eat not excess in limit we have to exercise how much not excessively you know, only to you know till we get the sweating in the forehead in the chest and the back so it's called as ardha shakti we have to exercise till half of our strength so all these are explained so the nutrition that is coming in should be absorbed should be digested well and also should be utilized by the body well and then there is sama mala kriya so timely elimination of urine feces and sweat should happen so as per ayurveda the uh, there's a concept called as uh, uh, urge should not be initiated artificially when we should visit washroom only when we have urge to defecate or to urinate so that needs to be uh, taken care and that sets when we have to have food only when we are really hungry just because it is 9 am is not the time to have food it when we should feel hungry and only then we have to have food then the question is if this if i do not feel hunger at 9 am and then and i have to go to office then what to do so then we have to adjust our diet so that we feel hunger at 9 am maybe we have to reduce the dinner quantity a little bit so that we actually start feeling hunger at 9 am so in this way we have to maintain our urge uh, just so we f- we drink water when we are feeling completely thirsty we eat when we are completely hungry and we we pass our urine and feces when there is urge to that so this is a way to listen to the body signals and adjusting our body accordingly so that we this is what the uh, you know to live as per the na- na- natural well being so we listen to the body and act according to the body this gives us Uh, an exercise to being health conscious next is prasanna atma indriya mana uh, we have covered that the soul the sense organs and the mind should be given equal importance and this is where the well uh, social well being all is also to be given much importance and there's a famous uh, uh, story of jk rowling so this jk rowling wrote the very famous harry potter s- series she is said as the first billionaire author meaning she wrote books and became a billionaire just because of writing books so in one point of life she was divorced and she was having a child and she was lacking a purpose then she started going to a nursing home and hel- helping elderly people so that helping elderly people gave her the positive uh, positive vibe and positive energy and uh, uh, there's a famous uh, uh, kabira's dohe in which he explains that uh, uh, it 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 runs aduva nudi intirabeku shanti nelasabeku itarara shanti ge shramisutanave shanti apadeyuvevu kabira shanti apadeyu vevu means whatever you speak adu anudi whatever we speak should bring in some peace to other people as well and he explains only way to achieve mental peace and satisfaction is by working for the peace and sati- 
peace and satisfaction of other people so only way we feel this life to be fulfilled is you know of course the money and the health and good life all these things having doing foreign tours all this bring happiness but the only real satisfaction at the end of our life will bring if we help others and bring peace to other well being other living beings as well and then there is another definition of charaka moving quickly here it explains sama mamsa pramana for uh, the person to be healthy his musculature should be proportionate he should be well organized with the body tissues the bones the joints and the ligaments and the muscles are compact that uh, it is called as sama samhanana if they are in compact it leads to healthy body drida indriya strong sense organs sensory and motor functions uh, there uh, it is also a thing to observe in if a person to uh, things to decide if a person is healthy or not then sh- uh, then shut pipasa atapa saha we have to eat when we are hungry but we should not be dependent on food all the time if you do not get food we should still sustain it that tolerance capacity is explained as sattva can you can you suppress your hunger just for an hour or so can you tolerate a little bit of thirst just for a little bit more time or not so in the ancient times when our, like, our ancestors were like living in the forest etc they were not ge- getting their foods and, and the water etc as per their time so they they were uh, in a constant amount of stress and their co- constant amount uh, constant uh, level of some consciousness and there was always a healthy amount of stress so if we are totally living a comfortful life that we forget that warrior mentality and that leads to a lot of problems so we should have some amount of stress mentally like we should be challenging ourselves can we read two pages a day today then tomorrow can we read two and a half pages so whatever we are doing we should be challenging ourselves in that way and physically also we should be challenging ourselves to control the shut control the hunger a little bit control the uh, thirst a little bit control the sun atapa is like sun exposure can we control it this challenging ourselves also leads to health shita vyayama samsaha so, so we should be controlling i mean we should be tolerating a little bit of coldness or winter and we see sometimes uh, that some people get into the rain and it's just drizzling and some drops of rain is falling on our head and they get worried oh this is rain is happening like i, I have to run so rather than that absorbing it and allowing some drops of rain to fall on our head and our body and just tolerating that i'm not saying that we should drench in our rain once in a once in a while just that mental difference of just panicking just because a few drops of rain fell on our head whereas other per person being tolerant to that the tolerance capacity we should always have so our elders th- they were working the farms and you know hunting and gathering that they were doing they were not having all the luxuries in our life so we have all the luxury of technology everything uh, medications uh, everything available at our disposal in in, in just on a smartphone in that also we should not give up the warrior mentality so that leads to health health and then there is samapakta samajara we already uh, uh, dealt a good uh, bit of it digestion and metabolism component and good muscular body is explained so all those balanced musculature compactness of all the body tissues where different digestive system and the respiratory system nervous system everything is acting in a coordinated way good amount of sense organ control and sense organ health is explained uh, this this is explained as an another concept called uh, ati yoga ayoga and mithya yoga for example speech we should not speak ati we should not speak excess we should not speak less we should not be doing hina yoga we should not be not speaking at all this ayoga and mithya we should not be speaking in a wrong way 
So this is explained to the ears, eyes, nose, etc. So good control of sense organs, ability to withstand the disease, withstand the little bit of troubles in our life without panicking and with courage and hunger tolerance, pipasa tolerance, uh, tolerance to heat, heat rays of the sun and also the winters, coldness of the winter, ability to tolerate good amount of exercise, healthy digestion, and these are all explained as, uh, uh, you know, leads to health. And for, for all this to happen, this Ayurveda explains right time to wake up. We should wake up before the sunrise, right time to sleep. Usually in the ancient times with the sun setting around 8, 8, 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. they were sleeping. Regular eye care, nasal care with nasal drops and oral care with tooth brushing and uh, tongue cleaning, etc. It's explained as juva and relekana, oil pulling, exercise, healthy dietary habits, so good social conduct and night, healthy night regime in terms of brahmacharya, etc. So these are all explained. And also, as per season, we have to change our diet and lifestyle to accustom it. Uh, for example, in the, uh, in the autumn season and in the summers, there is pitta component, component going up. Probably we should be taking a lot of coolant diet in that. And in the uh, shishira or in vasanta rutu, there is kapha going up. So we should be taking a lot of spices. So all these things are well explained in Ayurveda to explain a uh, healthy diet. So the swastha or well-being is comprised of healthy lifestyle, balanced diet, good amount of uh, tolerance, and not worrying about the little things, M mental health, maintenance with yoga, pranayama, and meditation, balanced social health, and timely panchakarma and detoxification, this is another uh, topic for probably for another day. And daily therapies such as oil pulling, regularly applying oil to our bodies, and regularly bathing and nasal drops, all these are explained as way of maintaining well-being. So before I conclude, I would like to thank Krishnamurti sir and all the organizers at Tatoloka and senior people, and uh, uh, thank you all for patient listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shabar. After listening, I find that how we never notice our own body, how many things taking place within the body day in and day out, every moment, which we don't, we seldom notice that. The Agni and the Sama, Sama Kriya, amazing. That's the reason why in our own system that watch the breath, be conscious of your own breath, moment of life. So our system, our Vedic system, gives profound advice of watching our internal movements every moment. That's what we try to do to propagate in Tattvaloka. Now it's a question time. Now um, I request audience to raise any questions. Uh, I just have uh, two questions uh, somebody has sent to me and also before that uh, let me ask. Uh, the question, first question is, Allopathic medicines create side effects and dependency and often we become a lifelong addiction, lifelong orientation to that. Why it happens? And this is one question which some people ask that I want to Dr. Siddharth to ask. And the second question is, with the proliferation of uh, Ayurvedic medicines, are there real quality standards of preparation of Ayurvedic medicines? This is the one question we call. In allopathic medicines are based on extensive clinical research and overseen by tough regulatory standards. Do we have that kind of a standards in, in oversight, in preparation? Because very often we find that a lot of metallic objects are, are, are getting ingrained in, into Ayurvedic medicines. So this is the two questions which I thought the experts can answer that. Well, you see, you must understand that uh, what do medications that we use in allopathic medicine address? As I said, they don't address the root cause of a problem. They only address an intermediary mechanism, right? And <clears throat> obviously, they're bound to have side effects. They're chemicals. 
uh, when you when you try to interrupt one pathway, another pathway is going to either overexpress itself or underexpress itself, and so you're going to have some side effects. When you say addiction, I think it's a state of mind. I mean, either you you develop sufficient capacity to say, okay. Let me work myself to say that I will get off this pain medication in the next six months, which means I have to work myself up. So addiction can be because we simply don't want to, as I said, want to change our lifestyle, we don't want to challenge ourselves and say, can I reorganize my life so that I ensure that the trigger that's actually causing this starts decreasing. <clears throat> Second, I think we should also understand that a lot of drugs that are used work up in the minds, in the brain. And they are going to be addictive because they interrupt, they interrupt a lot of uh, neurotransmitters, a result of which something else is taking place. So dependence happens. So modern medicine doesn't address root causes. They're all temporizing effects as far as I'm concerned. You know, they'll help, they'll help you through a crisis for the moment. But I think we have to work ourselves back to ensure <clears throat> that we must understand what is it that triggered my disease process. And so that it doesn't persist or it doesn't get worse, I need to address that. And only then will you get off the medication. Otherwise, yes, it's a pure chemical. And when we give something, we do not understand what else is happening. Right. We don't understand the downstream effects of what blocking one channel does to us, uh, which is, I think today we're going back to saying holistic medicine. You look at a person in, in, in totality and say, okay, I'm giving this, but this is temporizing. You also need to do three other things which are non-medicinal if you want to get off the story. And I think that is where... Uh, Practitional modern medicine are slowly you, you're going. Uh, all our cardiac centers now have yoga and meditation as part of rehab, which we never did earlier, because we realized that uh, putting a stent and giving them aspirin is not any assurance that you will not get a block of the stent again in a few years down the line, right? So I think lifestyle change is the answer. So chemicals will always do what they're supposed to do because we don't understand enough. The human body is an amazing uh, bit. I think uh, the, the more we think we have found, I realize we realize that more we don't know. Actually, for every, every question we try to answer, I think it cops up 10 more questions about which we know nothing. So, you know, that's, that, is the, that is the way it works. So. And to answer Sir's question, first, first of all, uh, there's this uh, common notion that Ayurvedic medicines are like side effect free. It's still a medicine and it is still trying to fix. It is, okay, allopathy is like paracetamol, it's just one chemical, whereas Ayurveda medicine is turmeric, for example, it is containing 100 plus uh, medicinal principles bundled together, that's what turmeric is. So even Ayurveda medicines also have side effects. So we need to be a little careful uh, generalizing that, you know, uh, all allopathy medicines do not have side effects, whereas all Ayurveda medicines are also not free from side effects. So uh, everything has to be taken with due caution and care. So uh, that's where this Ati Sarvatra Varjayat uh, comes into picture. For example, there's this uh, uh, thing called, a thing that we use as Bhallataka. Bhallataka is marking nut. In Hindi it's called as Bilava. I don't know the Tamil name of it. So when we are purifying it, it you know, we cut it and put, cut the seeds and put it in the brick. And then it is like rubbed. While rubbing, it's, it's so hot that you know, people who are doing the purification process, they get the boils. So there are very serious, so where this Bhallataka or marking net is used in the treatment of vitiligo, is used in the treatment of cancer and so on and so forth. 
So higher the medical intervention that the chemical is doing in the body, allopathic, ayurvedic, yoga, or whichever, there will be some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of negative effects that will be seen. So probably the answer to it is whether ayurvedic or any other system of medicine is balance and a conscious effort to adopt into natural measures like taking care of digestive system, healthy amount of exercise, healthy diet, etc. So this will help us to be less reliant on any medicine, be it allopathic or Ayurvedic. And there is a question on like, uh, you know, how Ayurveda medicines evolved. So we use Chavan Prash. So Chavan Prash was given to Chavana Maharshi thousands and thousands of years ago. Chavana Maharshi was there, he became ill and, you know, in a short period of time, uh, he became very sick and he was about to die. And there was this, there's a story of this Ashwini Kumaras who are considered as celestial gods. So they formulated this Chavan Prash and this was given to this Chavan. Uh, ch ch they, pre they prepared a prasha, means herbal jam, with this Indian gooseberry or amla that we call it, Nalika. So that was used and then a herbal jam was created and given and he became young again. So. So that is the origin of this Ayurveda. Nobody knows like how it is formulated. Who wrote Vedas? Like Veda Vyasa Maharshi wrote Vedas. But who actually thought about all those things? I mean, Veda, Maharshi, Veda Vyasa Maharshi collected all those things and formulated Vedas. And if we... So we have this Charak Samhita written by Acharya Charaka, Sushrata Samhita written by Acharya Sushrata. So they wrote. They wrote. That doesn't mean that they ideated the whole thing out of their... Uh, out of their intelligence and they did not write it. It is again a collection of the rich experience of many generations and thousands of years of experiences getting uh, consolidated in the form of textbooks which form the basis of Ayurveda even today. But, so this has happened and this, uh, there's a beautiful concept of like Apta. Means Apta is the one who is uh, Nirajatama, who doesn't have Rajas and Tamas at all, who is not attracted to money or anything, who is of purely sattvic. And they have written these test books and we, we follow that. But in current scenario, it's very difficult for us to judge who is Apta and who are not. Uh, so now we are also social, uh, we are gradually adopting the cl modern clinical methods because the inquisitive mind asks a lot of questions and we have to answer and we have to be more, uh, we have to have scientific answers also. So a lot of clinical trials are also getting under, uh, underway with Ayurveda and uh, Ayurveda in a large scale. And coming to the he heavy metal component or the question of that. So just recently I was uh, uh, going through this, uh, in the last week itself, there's a huge rush into, uh, into the way uh, into a research where they they are trying ph physicists and this metal specialist metallurgy who study that there is a huge rush into conducting uh, inventing superconductors so superconductivity there is huge amount of research going on so I was watching a debate on that and they the common understanding of that was barring a few metals like iron and the zinc, etc., in the physical, physical world and also in the medicinal world, we do not have much idea of how the very different metals work in our body. We have very little knowledge of that. And what are the heavy metals that are used in Ayurveda? I mean, the heavy metals have a taboo and of course they have their specific poisonous effects, etc., which the ancient scholars have clearly en enlisted for each metal or anything. They have enlisted a list of diseases if that is overused or abused, if they are not used after proper purification, what and all diseases it will cause, they have enlisted. 
and what is the method of purification and what is the method of incineration. For example, they had to be ground with uh, decoction of trifla or the neem or the, you know, uh, many different herbs and they had to be made into what you call as chakrikas or cake and they had to be subjected to intense heat and that even the amount of heat, etc. are very well documented. Then we get the basma and that basma with the we do not know with the current technology that that basma prepared with that, uh, that metal after being subjected to these many herbs in processed in different ways is not in the chemically we say it as the oxide of it loha loha basma iron oxide of iron oxide zinc zinc oxide etc but act actually we do not know exactly the details of it so I would like to conclu conclude this debate on the metallic basma aspect is that, yes, Ayurveda uses some of it. We are well aware of the side effects of it. They are used in, in what you call as mandalas in about like 40 to 41 days only in a very limited quantities specifically told. These are also told in MGs, MG level of quantities they are used for a very limited period of time. Probably like, like how the modern chemicals have specific action in the body, they also have specific action. We see that in day-to-day -day, uh, practice of Ayurveda. They, they are giving results. So we use it, but we are well aware of the side effects and it is used under control, under limits in proper quantities. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, there's always this like, where is the Ayurvedic limit? Or, you know, what can Ayurveda treat and what it cannot treat? For example, if there is a ligament tear, I'm coming to the specific answer to your question. There's a ligament tear, there's a partial ligament tear in the, in the knee. Someone was walking and twitched his knee joint or ankle in this partial ligament tear. There are mechanisms in Ayurveda to rejuvenate this torn, uh, torn ligament and to heal it and, you know, in, in a way to even to rebuild it to a certain extent. It is possible with Ayurveda and Panchakarma treatment and so on and so forth. But there's no, there's, there's no remedy specifically for the complete tear of the ligament that out of thin air we cannot build the ligament as such. And also, so similarly probably is the case with the, uh, the tympanic membrane uh, being torn. And also, as much as there, there was this panchakarma therapy and there, there was this uh, herbs using everything, there was also this in ancient times there was also this full-fledged, full well-established Shalya Tantra, this Acharya Sushruta. You know, if, uh, if in a war, arrow entered you here and you know, came back from there, they were doing surgeries. And the surgery was, surgeries they were conducting were, were like very well established. They were doing the, even the plastic surgery of the nose. If you go to YouTube and uh, search for like a Sushruta's rhinoplasty, there's a very well documented uh, thing done, done by some London doctors, how they uh, actually went into Sushru Samhita and studied and they are adapting this uh, well established surgeries, etc. So as much as Ayurveda is uh, uh, fantasized to be treating all with natural measures and all, like all other medical sciences, it also has its own uh, uh, limitations as well. I believe is uh, treatable mostly, and the wear and tear of the body due to age. For example, if I have some digestion issue, it could be a dosha condition or it could be just my age-related uh, factor. So does Ayurveda differentiate that? And uh... Yeah. So we, somebody is young, 20-year-old, and he participates continuously in marathons, like 43 plus kilometers. He runs almost twice, twice a week. In, in about a year or so, he can develop wear and tear. In Ayurvedic terms, 
he is doing excessive exercise uh, in one form and that is leading to wear and tear. tear. So there, vata dosha is getting increased and we have to do the vata dosha balancing in terms of oil massage and uh, so on and so forth, many therapies are explained. So that is there. And there is this elderly person who was he healthy throughout his lifespan and now he is getting wear and tear due to his natural aging. So this vata dosha increase may not necessarily happen with the causative factor. If we divide our entire lifespan, Ayurveda explains that the first part of our life is dominated by kapha dosha. In that, the building of our body tissues happen. Like kapha is made up of earth and water element. It can be compared to brick and cement. So with the brick and cement, we build the house and building blocks. So in the initial stage, uh, of our building, uh, say up to anywhere between 20 to 25 years, the kapha dosha builds our body. Then, in the middle part of our life, pitta is naturally dominant. That's why in our uh, teenage and in our up to 30, 35 years of age, we eat a lot of spices and nothing will happen. But after 35, if we eat the same amount of spice as we were eating in our teenage, we, we get the gastritis and the other symptoms. So. So that is, that's why, that's because Pitta Dosha is naturally dominant in the middle part of our life. And in the end part of life, Vata naturally gets dominant. That's why even the wear and tear happen. So uh, in, in that case, the ligament being weak or the bone, uh, bone getting degenerated and degenerative, uh, degenerative tissue, uh, sorry, degenerative changes in the brain tissue, all those things are due to Vata Dosha. So Vata can aggravate due to the process of aging and also due to the process of excessive exercise and so on and so forth. You know, sometimes uh, it, it kind of uh, works or, or sometimes it doesn't work or whatever. And, and when we go to the doctor, we may not be in a position to say our condition, you know, correctly. And in the absence of any, you know, testing gadgets and etc., uh, Ayurvedic doctor relies on what exactly I say. You know, for example, if I have a burning sensation, I may say, no, 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 I'm eating more. I know I'm eating more. Mm -hmm. I may be actually eating more to quench the burning sensation, but I may not have used the correct word. Mm -hmm. So, and Nadi, you know, may not help because I may go at different points of the time, you know, full stomach or whatever, etc. So, in that sense, how do we actually communicate it properly in order for the diagnosis to be effective? I find it as a, you know, bit of a difficulty in, in certain cases. Yeah, one is that it's not the, uh, I mean, there is this, uh, I, I told about uh, ideal qualities of a uh, patient. Uh, it's called Ardhya, Ardhya Rogi, patient should be rich. Bishagvasya, patient should be under the control of the doctor, meaning very obedient to the doctor's advice. That can be a little controversial in this modern age, being doctor being, uh, you know, uh, even I rather doctors also being a little bit greedy. Uh, so ideally the doctor, I mean, patient should be following all the advice from the doctor, Bishak Vashya. Then it's told Gnapaka. So patient should have good memory. So what I suggest, I mean, we, you know, we wait for long and, you know, after one hour we get our appointment and we get, go inside and the doctor has only 10 minutes, so we have to, Right, we have to explain everything. Better to take all the symptoms that what you feel when you are resting at home or in the waiting area, better to write it down so that you do not forget. And it is not that you, the patients have to learn how to explain the disease. So patients are already patients, they are already suffering with the disease. They are not having the burden of explaining in the way that the Ayurveda doctor explains. It is the doctor should be skillful to understand what the patient is saying. From the, pa from, the, from the patient point of view, let us write all the symptoms and explain. So one of the mistakes that I see is that a patient comes and explains that I have skin allergy and, uh, and they keep on explaining the skin allergy alone and sometimes we doctors think that, you know, okay, skin allergy, I start ideating that, you know, skin allergy, so itching is there, itching is a kapha symptom, probably this, probably that, and I start writing. Then at the end they say that, oh, I have that also. And I am uh, hypertensive, I am taking this medicine also. So maintaining a list of medicines, maintaining full list of uh, symptoms, 
uh, and out of out of which, which for which specific symptom or the disease I am coming to you. We can expect the patient to do only this much. And it is, a doctor should be skillful enough to understand, navigate through all the narrations of the patient and, uh, you know, uh, there, there's a, like how the, uh, the, the patient's ideal qualities are there, uh, doctor's ideal qualities are also explained. It's called Maitri Karunyam Arteshu. Uh, Maitri, doctor should be friend, friendly in his approach. And what is your symptom? Why, why are you not walking? It should not be the way. Karunya, he should be having some empathy. It should not, it's not like, I have 100 patients, so I'll be like, tell your symptom, I'll give some more treatment. So that's also there. So. Thank you. Thank you. So, so you have a response? Hello. My question to both the doctors is that, uh, in recent times, there is a lot of emphasis being given on organic food. So could you just uh, tell the importance of organic food for the health? Does it really make any difference? Because they are not available all the time and they are very expensive too. Well, you know, the issue of organic foods is emerging because of the way uh, our agricultural practices are happening. So much of pesticides and so on. And one of the questions I've asked a lot of organic people is, how are you sure that there is no leaching of pesticides from your neighboring field into your soil? So organic Farming um, requires a very large area of buffer zone for to prevent this. So I think the, the issue is re <coughs> re really related to uh, the way we are uh, farming. <coughs> um, in fact, my wife and me uh, were recently reading because a cousin of hers runs uh, organic farming and he shared with us a book of Fukukoa uh, who is a Japanese uh, uh, agricultural scientist who said that the way we grow foods are all wrong. You know, it, it's not natural. For in instance, he says in his book that uh, tilling the soil is the worst thing that you can do for productivity. You're actually doing harm. And so, essentially, the problem we face today is the, there's no point blaming, uh, blaming, uh, uh, you know, um, modified foods from factories. I think the very source is the way we cultivate, the way we genetically modify them, the way we treat with pesticides. I think all of them are, are having their effects. So while it's nice to have this label of so-called organic foods, uh, organic uh, farming is a very expensive process today because you have to undo so much and compete with the rest of the cheaper options that are there. So, uh, rather hard to say that uh, whether, whether uh, switching completely to organic foods is the answer. Uh, we have to be reasonably sensible and say, okay, uh, is, is there something, you know, I think it's also a bit of trial and error. If you have something and you believe that, it, you know, you had it earlier and now you're having a problem uh, with a certain brand, maybe all you need to is, uh, respond to signals from your body and say, look, I'm sorry, this is probably not okay for me. I need to revert back to something. So there's a bit of trial and error. So I know that organic farming is expensive and uh, this again goes back to saying that uh, uh, health is not related to only what medicine does and so it's I think related to what agriculturists do, what industry does, what others do. So it's it's it's, I think, all highly interrelated. So I would, I would say that uh, I don't think I would uh, use up all my financial resources going hunting for an organic food, uh, because I think that's being uh, up to the point, taking it to the point of absurdity. But I would say that we should try to look at things which are reasonably, which we believe are okay, and uh, do some trial and error and look at how your body responds to something else. And as long as you remain well, that, that's fine for you. May not be good for somebody else. 
I just want to respond to what that madam asked about your history taking. You know, I think it's a, it's a huge challenge in, in medical care. People have forgotten the soul. History taking is an art. And I think the fact that we have lost that uh, general physician who knew that half the problems you had had nothing to do with illness. They're related to your social problems at home with a neighbor and so on and so forth. And what they would do is, okay, you told me, I'll come and see you at home in the evening. And then he would sit with the mother-in-law and explain to her what she should not be doing with the daughter-in-law so that the problem symptoms <laughs> don't happen. So I think the, prop the issue is that physicians should be socially relevant in the communities where they work. I've experienced this working through the states of India <coughs> and uh, rural, urban, uh, that you have to understand the, the, the local social and cultural milieu for you to be able to pinpoint and say what's wrong. And I think 50% of the problems do not have an origin of an organic problem. You know, it's not really a disease, bacteria causing. It's all something else that's happening and manifesting. So you're true when you say that I am not able to exactly, exactly uh, express to the physician what I have is because you probably have not been able to link that that event at which happened, which is not a disease, is what's causing my symptoms. If you knew it, probably you would have taken care of it and you don't have to come to a physician. It is the lack of... Uh, the individual's inability to link something which is which which believe is normal uh, interaction, but you know, is actually affecting me in some way, and the inability of the physician to understand the social structure of the patient or the group of patients with which they are handling, and I think this is a increasing challenge for us because uh, we get we get people from all over. You come and establish a practice somewhere, and you haven't quite understood what happens over there. So I, have been, I should say that to all my residents and students, and I said, look, uh, before you, you advise somebody and saying what you should do, you should first understand no, nobody comes by choice to a hospital. I mean, nobody wants to come and visit you. It's not a fancy, nice place to come. It's not a mall or something, a luxury space, enjoyable space. They come because they're... But you must also try to find out what took them so long to come to you. And what triggered at some point of time? So it needs a patient, and as he rightly said, a physician has five minutes, he starts writing a prescription the moment you start walking, asks you three questions, <laughs> gives you a, a long list of pills, and out you go. It's, it's, like a, you know, it's like a manufacturing plant, you just churn out. But I think this is, a, this is unfortunately an increasing problem that we see. We have forgotten that great skill. You know, Indian physicians were always... Uh, very, very uh, uh, respected in the West because of that skill. But today, uh, that has disappeared completely. So we are put in at, with everybody else. So I think this is a problem. So we have to, therefore, learn to, as he said, be able to consolidate the information, do some analysis ourselves and say, OK, could this all possibly have a checklist and say, OK, okay these things happen, even though they're not apparent? but maybe that's contributing. You don't know, but maybe that physician will be able to relate. So I think the onus is increasingly falling on individuals who have the problem to be able to say this is my problem rather than the physician being able to say so. But this is a changing society, a changing landscape in healthcare, and we are going to see more of it with commercialization that's happening at this moment. And we just simply have to, we picked up all the, unfortunately, not the best practices of the West into our system and forgotten a lot of good things that we had, but, uh, but that's reality. No, no, we knew diabetes for a long time. We did not know how to treat it, right? Today we understand diabetes in a better way, right? We, we picked up people when they're overtly very, very... Today we are talking about something called pre-diabetes and saying, okay, huge number of you are at risk for becoming diabetes. Yes, insulin came much later. 
Other drugs came much later, but we also recognize that in all this is also a lifestyle change, right? So uh, you, I think the question is that a lot of diseases existed, but I think they are also on the rise because of lifestyle. So tr there is a partly, partly that some of the diseases were not ex diagnosed because we didn't have the tools then, but there's also a fact that the same diseases now are actually exponentially increasing in numbers due to environment, lifestyle, and so on. So it's a problem we just have to. It's not true that things didn't exist. I think even in, in, the, in the, uh, our ancient Indian literature, uh, diabetes has been described, and a treatment for it is described. Not the insulin way, but there was a treatment described. So nothing was unknown, uh, really. Even cancers of sorts have been described, not the way we know it, but tumors have been described. So I think things existed, but it's just that we, we now, uh, it has a different connotation. People probably in the past accepted it as a way of life and said, okay, this is what I've got to go. You, are, you, are, you didn't get affected by it, but today you get affected. Oh, I've got, I've got diabetes, I'm going, to, I'm going to become a cripple, and I'm going, this is what happened, I will not live another five years, what happened to me, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, we, we haven't, uh, I think it's, it's the mindset that we have today of wanting to hold on, wanting to hold on to our existence, uh, uh, without a purpose, as you said, the ikigai. We don't have an ikigai, and we still want to hold on, and that doesn't make sense. Come on. Yeah. So, uh, I want to thank uh, I want to thank the, the management, and also the doctors for having enriched us with a beautiful capsule form of information, which I think is mind-boggling. We wouldn't have got it at all. I just wanted to, just two short questions. Is fatty liver supposed to be a social, I mean, lifestyle disease or is it something to do with an organic uh, physiological thing? Second thing is, uh, is can zinc be prescribed as a uh, immunity measure for uh, taking on a daily basis some vitamins or something like that? Thank you so much, doctors. Yes, to some extent, fatty liver is, uh, is a function of our lifestyle. Uh, but all fatty liver doesn't go on to become, you know, if I was to run a liver scan on, uh, let's say, about 100, 200 uh, healthy, apparently healthy young adults, you would find that about 5% of them or 7% will show fatty liver, though they have no, no symptoms. So fatty liver, yes, is, is a function of our lifestyle, our diets, and uh, it certainly can be reversed in the early stages. Uh, um, the second question you said was related to zinc. You know, we have to be a little cautious about this uh, use of minerals and vitamins uh, as supplements without understanding. Uh, and the best example is when we try to teach children who are malnourished, and we know they're multiply malnourished. But we also know that when we don't, when we give them uh, in so-called therapeutic doses, it actually inhibits the absorption of the other. So our understanding of how um, absorption takes place is limited because something else limits the other. It's also to be imp uh, noted that uh, just simply consuming something in the absence of disease or, or you know, a potential uh, may not do any ha good. In fact, if it's a very water-soluble kind of thing, you pay a lot of money for it to just be dispensed into the sewage, uh, right? And nothing else. So I think... Uh, uh, I am, for one, uh, a quite a non-believer on this popping up multivitamins. You know, unless you believe that there is a reasonable basis to say that you don't have it, which could be a function of, A, your diet. Uh, your dietary patterns may change, and so you may say you're not going to get enough of this, and you know with aging you need some, some of these and you don't consume all that. But I, I am personally not a votary for people consuming uh, multivitamins and all just for the sake of saying, okay, it gives you well, you know. So I think because I know, having worked with malnourished children, having worked with these studies, that uh, absorption doesn't happen and we actually measure the levels, nothing happens. And also, even if the levels are good, we don't know that it's going to actually benefit in any function. So that's another thing. And vitamin D is one great example. We most Indians are vitamin D deficient, if you go by the definitions we have. 
80%. But most people don't have any disease. So this, this statistical way of taking a cutoff and saying that uh, people who are in the mid 90% are normal, people in the extremes are abnormal, is fraught with the problem that it has no functional relevance. So we have been now working on looking at vitamin D in particular and saying, is there a threshold level at which we can measure function? And say only when you go below that function and there is a altered function measurable by some kind of a simple blood test that I say that you are actually deficient. So I think one of the challenges of modern medicine is using too much of statistics and not relating it to function. And of course, don't forget, there's a huge industry pressure to keep a definition in such a way that the products can sell. You know, this is a problem, ethical dilemma that I think all of us in healthcare today face. Sir, you had something to ask. So I agree with your comment on the organic uh, thing. There's an excellent organic shop near my house. Went there and bought it, very stylishly. Bought a, bought a melon. Only when I saw the bill, it's about 20 times more than the market price. It's a problematic thing. The one handicap we see in allopathic system of medicine in India now is the absence of a thing called family physician. We used to, when we were all young, we used to have a family physician who we have a chat with us. He would refuse to take any money from us. In fact, you suggest you were talking about the West. In the US, there is some sort of a referral systems. I am allotted a doctor, or I choose a doctor. He goes through me and then suggests a test, suggests a thing. I think the reverse has happened in uh, India. There is no hospital which does not carry this name called multi-speciality hospital. I was want to know, is there a thing a non-multi-speciality hospital at all in India? Is there anything that the medical system can do by which you can create the old system of a family physician? That will be extremely nice. Second is, whatever we may say, the interesting thing is that the Longevity of the Indian has really improved. Either it's because uh, I really don't know. It's a very interesting question. Why why it's happening? Because we are supposed to have more pollution, more things in the that. But one question I have to ask is: any system is an evolutionary process. If we start at the starting point of medicine in India. Sushrutta must have been about 1000 B. Uh, Allopathic founder must be Samuel Hallman, 1810. 2800 years have passed since we evolved, if you take Sushrutta as the common point. What's the evolution that we missed? For example, today, thanks to Krishnamurti, we don't have a homeopathic person here. Otherwise, you would have had a tram rate of homeopathy, but then I suppose Samuel is both an allopathic uh, person and a homeopathic person. I find that certain very interesting. Susutta, if he has created an 800 page book and created by the National Institute of Medical Heritage, who is using it? Why is that that when there is a lot of discussion relating to having a small session in the medical colleges for Ayurved, there's a tremendous supposition to that, it has dropped eventually. Two things, why they did not have continuity in the medical excellence that you see in Shushutta, but it's not there today. Second is, we should have handled a lot of things by now, if you are really continued some sort of research, anything that happened which broke that, why is it that we are not able to combine some sort of Ayurvedic and allopathic thing? Because, or is it totally impossible? Because today's uh, topic, title-wise, is amorphous. It's a well-being. Starting with the definition itself, you didn't, we didn't go into the tools of it. How do you achieve tools? That's a totally different thing. That's the response. I'll stop.
Uh, I mean, why the Sushrita's, uh, you know, research and he, he definitely compiled various different resources and put that into the form of Sushrita Samhita. That's true. And uh, uh, there was an excavation done in uh, now what is called as Pakistan. And they found out a tooth which, which was backdated to 9,000 uh, years before. And that truth was drilled. So that drilling of tooth was there 9,000 years ago. And Sushil Samhita was written somewhere around 3,000, 4,000 years ago. So, uh, so collectively the medical system was improving, 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 but we were, you know, for the past many centuries we were uh, ruled by the Western, Westerners and the Mughal invasion, all those things happened. And first thing that they wanted to do was kill all the sciences that we had developed by burning our universities and all. So that, there the, there the lineage sort of got altered. That's why the inventions that were done before couldn't continue further. And also post-independence, there was this cultural inferiority complex in our mind uh, developed in such a way that we started uh, neglecting our own cultures and started adopting more and more of the Western cultures. Has, uh, has done sufficient amount of damage that we have moved, uh, moved away from natural ways of healing. So now at least the positive thing is that everything is coming back to one full circle and people are becoming more and more conscious, health conscious and uh, becoming, uh, you know, na people are adopting natural ways of uh, healthy living. That's a good sign. And yes. so I think, you know, uh, uh, I have been part of several groups trying to integrate. It's not only homeopathy, we have Siddha. In fact, I, I initiated a work on Siddha with our institution and IIT to understand, you know, somebody talked about Nadi, and the question was that, how do you actually scientifically show that uh, a person who diagnoses, makes an impression with Nadi, collaborates with the way modern diagnostics work? So I think Yunani, all of them have certain role. Uh, he's very true that I think our, uh, the British uh, legacy continued and our Indian system. But I think now it's changing. We are now uh, increasingly in uh, many institutions and in fact the uh, government is now funding a lot of integrative research that can happen so that you can pick goodness of everything. Of course, you know, I don't think somebody from one system can prescribe another but you can always take the, the goods, uh, good practices of those which are not therapeutic in nature in that sense, but still understand how they can be integrated. And so I think there is a great deal of effort now to scientifically validate uh, our alternative systems of medicine, the Indian systems of medicine, uh, and, and, and mainstream them. The very fact that, you know, uh, we, I always, India is a pluralistic healthcare system. All our government hospitals, at least in the north, have uh, uh, Ayurveda and uh, allopathy and uh, all in the same this thing. That means you give freedom of choice to the patient to go wherever we are. We recognize them. So I think there is a great deal of effort trying to in integrate these and trying to scientifically validate. So I think a time will soon come where we will be using uh, good practices across. And as I just said, a lot of things that modern medicine also talks now realizes through scientific evidence is what uh, traditional medicine had talked about. And so I think modern medicine takes a while. It has an inertia in accepting something for which you're not able to provide the evidence. I think now we work the full circle and say, if Ayurveda said that, now I, I, I do a scientific work and now I say gut microbe is answer. And so, you know, then I say whatever he said is <laughs> valid. So that, I think it's an evolutionary process. We are learning science in, in that form. The family physician is a different story. I don't think this is the thing. I can talk for hours on this because I have been deeply involved when I was with the National Medical Commission and the MCI in trying to bring back family medicine in. But that's a debate for another time, not now. <laughs> uh, uh. Thank you, sir. I think we will certainly. Yes. 
Thank you. I think so. This is a. Sir, we will, uh, I think this is <laughs> it's, a, it's a matter of debate and certainly it's a food for thought for the next uh, symposium we'll have some other time. I think for want of uh, 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 time, and we, I think we should once again thank our experts for this great opportunity. Um, frankly, uh, we were, we were uh, um, considering this an off-day session earlier, but uh, we compressed it in two hours. But but so exciting and, and despite all the difficulties today, I'm glad that many people came today. Once again, thank you very much. I want to use more of our moment to. to Once again, thank you very much for coming. Uh, our request is, uh, please, uh, who are not seen Tathvaloka, please pick up a copy outside. We want more and more people to benefit from reading Tathvaloka. I uh, also we want to mention that Tathvaloka is now available online reading of a mobile device on all your iPad and all devices. We have created a new uh, system, so we want more and more uh, youngsters to be benefited out of it. We are starting a scheme by which. People can donate to school libraries to read Tathuloka and then we can give a volunteer uh, 25 names and we just bring in the, uh, the next issue Tathuloka will carry for 5,000 rupees donation. You will be able to benefit 25 people to read online reading and uh, 20 subscriptions to libraries. So it's worth bringing it. So please help us to, to spread the Vedic wisdom and the ancient thoughts to all the things. Once again, thank you very much. Happy Independence Day. Good night. Thank you very much. <laughs>